I'll very briefly touch on antiphospholipid syndrome as well and just give you a few cases that I've come across um, with antiphospholipid syndrome as well. In fact, my first um, contact with Professor Hughes was, um, I, I had two cases, I was working in a rural area for a while, I had two cases where I had a strong suspicion of antiphospholipid syndrome because of the levido. So I started using those criteria and one question I started asking is, is there any symptom, uh, any medical issue that you've had at any point in your life that just doesn't seem right, that isn't getting better. I find that a, a useful sort of screening tool because they come up with several questions. On the other hand, I've also had patients that when I do take a medical history might say, well, why are you asking those questions? You're a psychiatrist. So I think there is a mind-body dichotomy there as well, but actually proactively asking for these questions has been very, very useful. Um, I did have these two questions with prominent levido, uh, levido reticularis, and one of them actually had an elevated anticardiolipin antibody. And it wasn't getting anywhere because the rheumatologist used to come just once a month, and phone conversations really didn't get anywhere. And I said I'll take a gamble, and I called the lupus unit, and Professor Hughes really was extremely helpful um, to give me the time of the day to, to talk through this. Um, and one patient um, had a brilliant response to low-dose aspirin. Um, she'd been diagnosed with cognitive dysfunction and um, depression for a very long time, whilst the other one, a few days later itself, was admitted to the emergency department with seizure. She, had, she was a young girl, and I'll show you her, her slide later on. But one of them had an extremely strong response to aspirin. The other one I'm not quite sure because I left shortly afterwards. Um, so that was my first contact, um, and uh, you know, a year later, um, Professor Hughes is here. So it's, uh, I think it's quite an, uh, uh, on the 30th year of APS anniversary, so I think it's a great moment. Um, I'll be talking about phospholipids, antiphospholipids, pathogenesis, and, and some neuropsychiatric associations that have already been studied. Um, we've, we've heard this before, but uh, a recent article in the BMJ actually said that it can affect all organ systems and hence it can pre present to any specialty. The syndrome is under-recognized and under-diagnosed in all specialties. The brain is, 60% of the brain, of the dry weight of the brain, is phospholipids. And it's sort of when we, when we look at the, at the antiphospholipid syndrome, although it's antibodies to the cofactors, um, it's, it's surprising that, the, that it hasn't been studied that widely in psychiatry. So I think there is something there for the future in terms of uh, research. And we know that the breakdown of phospholipids has been proposed as a pathogenesis in the development of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and depression. So these are the criteria for antiphospholipid syndrome. The three antibodies uh, briefly were covered. Uh, so we've got the lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin, and the anti-beta-2 GPI. I've had one patient that was diagnosed with conversion disorder with severe abdominal pain, seizures, odd psychiatric symptoms, um, but his, he had basically severe abdominal pain and there was no cause after endoscopies, etc. He had these negative, but anti-beta-2 positive. His father had strokes, early strokes, um, before the age of 50. In fact, the reason why I carried out the testing was because he mentioned the thing about his father, and I said, let's look at your dad's notes. And his dad had ANA of 1 is to 320, uh, factor 5 laden deficiency, and also uh, anticardiolipin positive. So it was natural to, to do it for him, and he had a positive anti-beta-2 glycoprotein antibody. And strangely, um, a few months later, he told me that his young daughter, I think she was 10 or 12, started developing odd neurological symptoms as well. Um, so I think there's a strong genetic aspect as well. So we know that there are multiple manifestations, and I think in the talk Tuesday, we'll be, uh, Professor Hughes will take us through several of these. So what, what do we know about antiphospholipid syndrome and psychosis? Kurtz wrote, and this was the first description, really, in, in psychosis, in a way, um, in, in the psychiatry journal. Antiphospholipid syndrome may present to psychosis many years before the occurrence of somatic symptoms. There are several case reports with response to immunomodulation, prednisone, and aspirin. Um, and this was the article that Professor Hughes also uh, brought up. 32% of untreated patients had low to moderate titers of anticardiolipin antibodies, thus implying their possible causal role in psychosis. And 
Something that's very interesting is clozapine is actually associated with an increase in anticardiolipin antibodies. So the question really is, is that what might be associated with possible venous thromboembolism? Is that what possibly is associated with myocarditis from an immune system perspective? We know that clozapine has very strong immunomodulatory pro properties as well, and is an immunosuppressant. We see that in clinical practice. Um, in the ANZJP, not so long ago, there was a small correspondence written about this as well. So APL may be implicated in antipsychotic-induced venous, venous thromboembolisms. Choreic movements have been associated, and an article in Medical Hypothesis Journal, they had, uh, I think there were eight cases, um, I might be wrong, eight or 13 cases, where they actually conceptualized psychosis as a plasminoger activator imbalance. It's been published where they found that individuals with psychosis after they developed a thrombotic episode were put on uh, warfarin or heparin, um, and their psychosis remitted. They're off psychiatric, um, antipsychotic medication. So again, a subset, um, are, there, there is an interesting subset there. In depression, um, or affective syndromes, again, there's a case of mania has been published. So there are independent case reports, and homocysteine comes to, we know that homocysteine has been studied. Uh, we know that vitamin B12 and folate is, is closely linked to homocysteine metabolism, and there is some association between homocysteine and APL as well. So lots of connections there. And uh, Mays um, has done a study in depressed individuals. Depressed individuals have significantly higher levels of antiphospholipid antibodies as well. Cognitive dysfunction, dementia that was mentioned, one of the commonest symptoms. But I'll, I'll, I'll bring your attention to something that's interesting. We know that the APOE2 receptor is, is, is described in Alzheimer's. And actually, the APOE2 receptor is a pathogenic target for the beta-2 GPI as well. That's one of the pathogenic mechanisms. And this binding has been demonstrated in endothelial cells and platelets. So I think looking across those um, specialties, there's some signals there that, you know, they might not be significant signals at all, but it's an interesting association. And this was a study in, in the mouse um, um, uh, model. A recent animal study revealed a significant interaction between the amyloid precursor protein genotype and the induction of antiphospholipid syndrome on a female background. So something there to, to look forward to, I guess, in the future. Um, the other thing, migraine. We know in psychiatry, migraine is actually clinically, uh, since I've started asking for migraine, get a lot more of it. Um, but migraine has been as traditionally described with CADASIL, cerebral autosomal dominant subcortical um, infarcts and leukoencephalopathy. Um, so mainly in neuropsychiatric field. But the question is migraine there and cognitive dysfunction, multi-infarct dementia, very, sounds very similar to APS almost. And uh, so I looked at whether there were any studies that looked at the measuring antiphospholipid antibodies in Cadacil. And Pantone actually reported three cases. So it's again at the case report phase. We know that subjects with migraines mentioned earlier, high risk of white matter abnormalities as well. And migraine and APS is considered to be a harbinger of stroke.